Welcome to Rugby and District Astronomical Society Sky Notes for the period from the 15th of September to the 20th of October 2013, covering the night sky up until the end of October. One thing to remember with the timing showing here is that the clocks change on the 27th of October in the early hours of the Sunday morning, so you'll need to wind your clocks backwards one hour. It will be shown as local times, both BST and GMT. As we begin to roll into October and towards the winter months, the days are getting considerably shorter. On the 1st of October, sunset is 18.38 and the day length will be 11 hours, 36 minutes and 44 seconds. On the 31st of October, the sunset will be at 16.35, this of course being GMT instead of BST, and the day length is only 9 hours, 42 minutes and 41 seconds. This is a decrease in day length of 1 hour 54 minutes and 3 seconds. The first website address in the notes that accompany this video will take you to a website called Time and Date, which you can look up sunrise and sunset times for Britain and the rest of the world. As usual, we'll be starting by looking at the night sky at midnight on the 1st of October, 2300 on the 15th and 2100 hours on the 31st of October. The reason for the two hour difference between the 15th and the 31st of course being due to the clocks changing. The summer triangle of Deneb Vega and Altair is setting towards the west and in the east we have Capella and Aldebaran beginning to rise heralding the rise of Orion and the rest of the winter constellations. The Milky Way is almost directly overhead and if you are looking up from a dark site or taking photographs of the Milky Way such as the one by Sarah Meek here which features Cygnus towards the middle which lies directly in the Milky Way you will see that there are brighter and darker parts to the Milky Way and it's not a perfectly straight line across the sky. The brighter parts are shown here and there's a large dust lane running through Cygnus here as well, as well which obscures our view of the stars behind it lying in the plane of the Milky Way. Moving on to the moon this month, we have new moon on the 5th of October, first quarter on the 11th, full moon on the 18th and last quarter on the 26th. On the 18th of October at 2350 hours there is a partial penumbral eclipse of the moon. The moon can have a couple of different types of eclipse. If we draw the sun and the earth here and the line of total shadow from the earth extending out into space you will see it forms a cone and anything entering here will enter what's known as the umbra or the total shadow of the earth. A little bit either side of that we have the penumbra which is an area of partial shadow where not all of the sun's rays can reach an object in that part of space. Because the moon's orbit is inclined to that of the Earth's orbit around the sun, it can completely miss the penumbra in its orbit, as you can see here above and below the Earth. It can hit, reach the penumbra, and that's what we're going to get on the 18th or it can pass completely into the umbra itself and it will be a total lunar eclipse. Although a total lunar eclipse doesn't mean the moon goes completely dark, completely because the Earth's atmosphere bends the light from the sun, causing it to go a colour between a light orange and a very dark red. Not it's a penumbral eclipse, it's also not a total penumbral eclipse. So you may see some darkening of the moon's surface at the south pole, and the red line here indicates the limit of the shadow but uh, you may not notice anything at all. Elsewhere in the solar system on the 3rd of October Uranus reaches opposition. Only superior planets can reach opposition because they lie outside of the Earth's orbit and opposition means the planet lies on the opposite side of the Earth to the Sun as you can see here. Uranus is quite faint and its maximum magnitude is 5.5 so you would be better off finding a nice dark sky and having a look with a pair of binoculars or a small telescope in the area between Pisces and Cetus as shown here. If you need a hand in finding Pisces and Cetus and then working your way on towards Uranus if you start out at Cassiopeia 
Draw a line down using the two stars shown here towards the great square of Pegasus. You can then use the two left hand stars, much as you would the pointers in the plow to find Polaris, to work your way down towards Pisces. The approximate position of Uranus is shown by the small cross, and you should be able to find this quite easily. Just work your way down, keep looking in the area for a small disc as opposed to a point, which would be a star. We also have an inferior planet reach its greatest elongation on the 9th of October. Greatest elongation is where the line drawn between the centre of the planet and the centre of the Sun, and the centre of the planet and the centre of the Earth, is 90 degrees. This is also useful to astronomers because it means the planet is at its greatest separation from the Sun, and particularly in the case of Mercury, means that it will be high above the horizon either before or after sunset. Of course, inferior planets do actually have two elongations, both east and west, depending on which side of the sun they are when compared to the Earth, as you can see here. For more in-depth information about superior and inferior planets and their positions relative to the Earth and what they're known as, Superior planets were featured in the May to June edition of Sky Notes Live and inferior planets in the June to July edition. We also have the Orionid meteor shower reaching its peak between the 20th and the 21st of the month. The shower usually produces about 20 bright meteors per hour, but the trouble is the moon is a waxing gibbous moon and will be fairly bright reducing the visibility of the meteors. However, if you do go out on the night of the 20th or 21st, take a pair of binoculars with you. You can have a look at the Moon and Jupiter, and also M42 in Orion, the Great Orion Nebula, and M45, the Pleiades. The Pleiades you'll be able to see around six stars with the naked eye. In a pair of binoculars or a small telescope, you'll be able to see far more. And binoculars are actually better than a telescope for this object. We're going to look at some of the man-made objects that can be observed. The Iridium flares are for central rugby, so if you live more than half a mile or so from the gyratory in the centre of rugby, you may need to go on to heavensabove.com and look up your own specific timings for these flares and if in fact they can be seen. 3rd of October we have a magnitude minus 5.2 flare and on the 9th we have an even brighter one at a magnitude of minus 8.3. This will outshine everything in the sky apart from the full moon and the sun itself. Also on the 15th we have a pass from the International Space Station quite early in the evening. This will be a magnitude minus 3.3 and the space station will be observable from when it rises in the west passing overhead until it disappears into the Earth's shadow shortly past the zenith. Moving on to this month's constellation of the month we're going to look at Perseus. In Greek mythology, Perseus was the son of Danae, who was the daughter of King Acrisius, who ruled Argos. Acrisius locked his own daughter and his grandson into a wooden chest and cast it into the sea because it was foretold that he would die at the hands of his grandson. I would imagine that being locked into a wooden chest and chucked into the sea would pretty much upset you and guarantee that you would be looking at finishing off the person that did that to you. However, Zeus caused the chest to be washed up on Seriphos and a fisherman, Dictus, rescued both mother and son and took them home where he raised Perseus as his own son. Dictus' brother was King Polydectes. He sent Perseus to bring the head of the Gorgon Medusa as a wedding present for him, expecting Perseus to die. But Perseus was protected by the gods in what must have been one of the best present lists of all time, where he was given a bronze shield, a helmet of invisibility, a sword of diamond and winged sandals. When returning from his quest, Perseus rescued Andromeda from Cetus, turning the sea monster into stone with the head of Medusa. Apparently, they all lived happily ever after, apart from Cetus and Medusa, of course. In the film Clash of the Titans, Cetus was replaced by the Kraken, which of course is one of the Norse mythological creatures, not a Greek one. There are a couple of ways of finding your way to Perseus, which is neither the brightest nor the most obvious of the constellations in the night sky. You can work your way up from the Great Square of Pegasus through Andromeda towards Perseus this way, following the arc of stars. Or, 
you can use Cassiopeia which is sometimes easier to find than Perseus because it usually sits higher in the sky and work your way down towards Perseus this way. If you follow this line it will also take you through the double cluster which we'll come on to a bit later when we look at the deep sky objects within Perseus. Looking at the stars in Perseus, Alpha is also known as Mirfak or Algenib. It is a supergiant star with a visual magnitude of 1.8 or slightly over and is approximately 510 light years from the Earth. It is the brightest star not only in Perseus but also one of the brightest in the sky. Alpha is circumpolar from the UK which means it never sets below the horizon. It's located in a star cluster known as the Alpha Perse Cluster which can easily be seen in binoculars. The star weighs around 7.3 times the mass of the Sun and is about 60 times the size of the Sun and, and staggering 5,000 times more luminous. Beta or Algol, which should correctly be known as Algul, is known as the Demon Star and it's one of the best known stars in the sky. It's the first eclipsing binary star ever discovered and one of the first variable stars to be found. Of course, this was not found by Western astronomers but by Arabic astronomers who were able to visually observe the brightening and dimming of the star. The apparent magnitude of the system is around about 2.1 but it's an eclipsing binary meaning that two stars pass in front of each other every 2 days, 20 hours and 49 minutes. The dimmer star passes in front of the brighter star for a period of around about 10 hours and of course the secondary, the dimmer star, passes behind the brighter star which causes a secondary dimming. Algol is the prototype for the class of stars known as the Algol variables which are eclipsing binaries. 7.3 million years ago it passed within 9.8 light years of the solar system and its apparent magnitude at the time would have been around about minus 2.5, far brighter than Sirius which is currently the brightest star in the night sky. Moving on to Gamma. Gamma would normally be the designation for the third brightest star in the constellation but in fact Gamma is the fourth brightest star in Perseus. It's a wide eclipsing binary pair with the two stars orbiting each other every 14.6 years. When the primary passes in front of the secondary, the visual magnitude drops by 0.55 magnitudes from the usual combined visual magnitude of 2.93. Hex is also a double star system with a blue main sequence star as its primary component. It has an apparent magnitude of 6.9 and lies 2,694 light years from the Earth. The star is notable because it's orbited by a neutron star, X Percy B. A neutron star is a hot remnant composed almost entirely of neutrons of a massive star that suffered a gravitational collapse during a type 1b, 1c or 2 supernova event. And finally, GK is a bright nova that occurred in 1901. With a peak magnitude of 0 0.2, it was the brightest nova of modern times until 1918 when a nova Aquilae 1918 occurred. GK subsequently faded to a magnitude minus 12 or 13, but has occasional outbursts. In the last 30 years, the outbursts have become pretty regular and last about 2-3 to three months every 3 years or so which makes GK resemble not a typical nova, but a dwarf nova-type cataclysmic variable star. GK is approximately 1500 light-years distant from the solar system and is the centre of the firework nebula. If we now move on to the deep sky objects that can be found within Perseus, the first one is M34, the 34th object in the Messier catalogue. This is an open cluster with a visual magnitude of 5.5 and lies approximately 1500 light years away. It's between 200 and 250 million years old and contains about 400 stars and is 7 light years in radius. The cluster was discovered not by Messier himself but his Italian astronomer colleague Giovanni Battista Holdima in the mid 18th century and included in Messier's catalogue of 1764. In good conditions it appears as a blurry patch slightly north of the line from Algol to Gamma Andromedae and of course will be better seen in a larger telescope. 
Messier 76, also known as NGC 650. This is a planetary nebula lying about 2,500 light years distant with a visual magnitude of 10.1. The nebula was discovered by the French astronomer Pierre Messier in 1780 and was included in Messier's catalogue. The Little Dumbbell Nebula is 2.7 by 1.8 arc minutes in size. It is regarded as one of the most difficult objects to observe visually in Messier's catalogue. The Alpha Percy Cluster, also known as Melot 20 or Colander 39, is an open star cluster in Perseus. It contains several blue stars and the brightest star in the cluster is Murfak or Alpha Percy which is a white yellow second magnitude giant. Other bright members of the cluster include Delta, Epsilon and Psi Percy. The estimated age of the cluster is between 50 and 70 million years. The cluster lies between 557 and 650 light years away and has a visual magnitude of 1.2 and makes for a very good binocular object. Mentioned earlier, when finding Perseus from Cassiopeia was the double cluster. This is also known as Coldwell 14 and has the catalogue numbers NGC 869 and 884 because this is in fact two clusters one behind the other. These open clusters are 7600 and 6800 light years distant respectively and are relatively close to each other in space. Their ages are estimated at 3.2 and 5.6 million years. With an apparent magnitude of 4.3, the double cluster can be seen without binoculars under dark skies, but observing each cluster individually will require a telescope. In a 4-inch Newtonian with a 25mm eyepiece, it is possible to see both of these clusters in the same field of view. Each of the clusters contains more than 300 supergiant stars and both of the clusters are heading towards the solar system at around 22 kilometers a second. But it's going to be a while before they get here. Finally in Perseus we're going to look at the California Nebula or NGC 1499. The nebula got its name because it resembles the outline of California on a map in long exposure photographs. It is an emission nebula about a thousand light years away and has a visual magnitude of 6.0. The nebula is about 2.5 degrees long in its long axis and is not actually particularly bright which makes it difficult to observe. NGC 1499 was first discovered by the American astronomer E. E. Barnard in 1884. This month's beginner spots looks at the libration of the Moon as seen from the Earth. There are three components to the libration of the Moon. The first of which we'll look at will be the libration of longitude, which is the east-west movement of the Moon, meaning we can see slightly more east and west than you would expect from the Earth. If the Moon's orbit was perfectly circular, we wouldn't actually be able to see anything other than the 50% of the illuminated Moon's surface when seen from the Earth at full Moon. However, the Moon's orbit is not actually circular, it's an ellipse, as are all of the planetary orbits. This means that at certain points the Moon is closer to the Earth than others, as can be seen from this image from NASA, which shows that at its furthest point, the Moon appears to be 12% smaller than it does at its closest point to the Earth. So looking at the east-west libration, we can see that at certain points, notably when the Moon is closer to the Earth, it accelerates in its orbit and appears to pass overhead earlier than it should do. What this means is that at certain points we can see slightly further east or slightly further west of the Moon than we would normally expect to. The second factor in libration is the latitude or north to south motion of the Moon. This occurs because the Moon does not orbit in the same plane as the ecliptic. 
the ecliptic being the line drawn from the center of the Earth to the center of the Sun and extending out. The Moon orbits at around 5.15 degrees away from the ecliptic so that it will not only appear to be in the same plane as the ecliptic but above or below meaning that from the Earth an observer can see slightly more of the south or north pole of the Moon than would be expected. And finally the third factor is the diurnal oscillation or the wobble of the Earth as it goes around its orbit of the Sun. What it means is that as opposed to the theoretical centre of Earth to centre of Moon axis that would be observed the observer from the surface of the Earth could see slightly to the east or slightly to the west of the theoretical axis of the Earth-Moon system. When the three factors are combined, you can see that from the Earth, the Moon appears to wobble and rotate slightly in its orbit. If you'd like to look at this feature of the Moon, you'll see how it rotates from one side to the other and back again as the Moon progresses in its orbit. Alternatively, on the other side of the Moon, there is another feature here that you can keep an eye on. And again, this feature will also appear to become more and less prominent in relation to the limb of the Moon as the Moon turns in its orbit. Finally, if you look at the south pole of the Moon, and in particular this group of craters here, you will see that these rotate north and south in relation to the Earth, and you will be able to see more and less of the south pole of the Moon during the lunar orbit or lunar month. Finally for this month we have a couple of images from our members, the first of which is from Dave Riley and shows the Nova near Delphinius, and the second of which is what you would hope to be a registration number for an astronomer, not just some random member of the public who ended up with this one. Finally, this is my final Skynet's presentation, so I'd like to thank my usual scriptwriter, Chris Longthorne, and our regular image contributors, Chris, Sarah, Dave, and for the first time, Mary, Adam, and of course the usual downloads from NASA that we were able to get. Finally, I'm going to leave you with a bit of a brain teaser. It's possible to draw a house with a cross in it or an envelope as shown here. But can you start with this shape and finish the puzzle without taking your pen from the paper, putting a hole in the paper, folding the paper, screwing the paper up and throwing it in, a, in the bin in a fit of temper or otherwise cheating? It is possible to solve it and the solution will be revealed at the October meeting of Rugby and District Astronomical Society. If you can't make it there, then happy puzzling. This is David Morris signing off for the last time for the Sky Notes Live of Rugby and District Astronomical Society.